ಕರುಣಾರ್ಣವಮಾಯ್ ಕರುದಗ್ಗತಿ ನಲ್ಗು ಅರುಣಾಚಲ ಶಿವ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸೊ ಟುಡೇ ಐ ವಾಂಟ್ ಟು ಟಾಕ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಐನ್ಸ್ಟೈನ್ಸ್ ಥಿಯರಿ ಆಫ್ ರೆಲಟಿವಿಟಿ ನಾವು ಡೋಂಟ್ ಗೆಟ್ ಫ್ರೈಟನ್ ವೆರ್ ನಾಟ್ ಗೋನ್ ಟು ಪುಟ್ ಅಪ್ ಎನಿ ಮ್ಯಾಥ್ ಓರ್ ಇವನ್ ಈವನ್ ಎನಿ ಚಾರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಟಾಕ್ ಓಕೆ ಸೊ ಡೋಂಟ್ ರನ್ ಆಫ್ ನಾವು ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಓಕೆ Einstein's theory of relativity was discovered when he was like 16 years old. And at the age of 16, what did he do? Barricade himself in a physics lab for six months? <laughs> no. He had never set foot in a physics lab. But yet, at age 16, he discovered probably the most influential theory of 20th century science. And it's still being proven today to be completely accurate and the right understanding of the way the universe works. So what was his theory? Well, basically, that consciousness is fundamental. What do we mean by that? that if you measure anything, especially motion, it has to be relative to an observer. And what is an observer? A conscious being. Yeah, some scientists argue, you can get the same results with a machine using a, like a telescope or a radio telescope or some kind of other machine to measure the motion. Yeah, you get the same numbers, but what do those numbers mean? See, that has to be determined by a conscious observer. Otherwise, they're just numbers. They have no context. Only in the context of the theory do they have meaning. See? Well, what was there before Einstein's theory? Before Einstein's theory, there was a theory that space is immovable, like a grid, you know, a three-dimensional grid, and that everything has a position in that grid, and its motion is measured relative to that grid. But wait a minute, there's no grid in space. <laughs> That's just our imagination. See, Newtonian space is just a projection of our own Euclidean geometry. It's not real. If you go actually in space, there's no grid. There's no way to determine your position or motion in space unless it's relative to something else. So when you read books on space travel or whatever, satellites and so on, They always say motion relative to the earth or relative to the sun or relative to some other body. See, and in that case, the motion is related to something else as a standard. And that's the way it has to be because space is absolutely empty. It's nothingness, it's emptiness. And one hunk of emptiness is the same as any other hunk of emptiness. There's no way to tell any difference. You don't go up in space and find a grid. <laughs> That's our projection. Thinking from, from ancient times that the earth is the reference of all motion. But now we know that it's not. The earth isn't still. It goes around the sun, it rotates, the sun moves through the galaxy and so on and so forth. Everything moves relative to everything else. So Einstein was the one to see this. He was the first one to actually see this. And he derived his theory by reasoning from first principles. He describes that in his books. I read all of his books when I was in high school, um, going out for physics uh, scholarship. 
And uh, I got the scholarship, but I rejected it and went to music school instead. Ha ha ha. Best decision I ever made. Anyway, Einstein derived his theory just by thinking and reasoning from first principles. And what is the absolute first principle from which he began? Consciousness is fundamental. Consciousness is absolute. Now, he doesn't ever come out and say this directly in his books, because if he did, then his, his whole theory would be rejected. He had enough trouble getting people to listen to him. You know, he had to go back to school, get a degree in mathematics, a doctorate, PhD in mathematics, invent his own mathematics called tensor calculus, and then publish his results as a scientific paper, which guaranteed that somebody would have to review it. And when it was reviewed, of course, there was earth shaking. <laughs> but the point is, he never set foot in a physics lab. His degree was in mathematics, not physics. So he simply, by thinking, beginning with the idea that consciousness is fundamental, he came up with the most influential theory of the 20th century as a 16-year-old boy. Now, he leaves hints all throughout his books that he studied Bhagavad Gita and Vedanta as a young fellow. So this is plausible because the Sanskrit scholars of Germany are perhaps the best in the world outside of India. So the uh, German translations of these works were available and very good explanations for them also. So it's quite likely that he was able to find books on Vedanta and the Vedas that explain all these things quite clearly. So now what is the meaning? Huh? What is the meaning of Einstein's theory? If everything has to be measured in relation to consciousness, a conscious observer, a conscious being, then consciousness is the absolute fundamental nature of reality. See, the things being measured are called objects. And the measurer, the observer, is called the subject. And the thing about consciousness is that it's always subjective. Consciousness cannot be measured itself directly. It can only be experienced by someone who is conscious. <laughs> this is why scientists can't solve the problem of consciousness. They refer to it as the hard problem. Well, duh, it's the easiest problem in the world. Are you conscious? Yes. Okay, problem solved. <laughs> You're conscious, and you're conscious that you're conscious. But there's no way to measure that consciousness. Why? Because it's absolute. It's like trying to measure, it's like a fish trying to measure the ocean. <laughs> uh, so how can we measure consciousness? We can't. We can only say that we are conscious. We can't know for sure about anybody else or anything else. But we know that we are conscious and we can measure things with our consciousness. We can observe, compare, and so on, calculate, and whatever. So if we go into physics and we research, for example, units of measurement, you know, the meter, centimeter, centimeters per second, uh, for velocity, the gram, the kilogram, and so on. They are all relative to some standard. Uh, like the meter, I think, is one-fourth of one million parts of the Earth's circumference from pole to pole. Uh, I don't know why they made that the standard, but it's a standard, well, I know why actually, because it fits 
with the gram and centigrade system. If you take one gram of water and you raise its temperature one degree centigrade, then you've used one uh, joule of energy or something like that. And these are all interlocking definitions for a whole system of measurement. And this is another very clever invention. It allows you to make calculations really easily without having to consider so much the units conversion. Try doing the, try doing the physics of just simple mechanics using the English system, for example. It's impossible. <laughs> but using the metric system, it's very easy. So anyway, Einstein, all by this time, was working in the metric system. But he noticed there is actually no fundamental definition of any of these terms. They're all defined in terms of one another. Circular definitions. The gram is defined in terms of calories at per second and centimeters, and everything is defined in terms of everything else. There's no one absolute thing that is the basis of all these measurements. So Einstein started pondering this, and he came to the conclusion that consciousness is the basis because it is stated in the Vedas and Vedanta and Upanishads and all the Vedic scriptures. And by thinking this through from first principles, he made a theory that still stands undefeated. So, why am I talking about this? <laughs> because we should do the same thing. I did the same thing. I said, you know, because Einstein was my hero when I was in high school. And that's when I also started studying yoga and meditation, reading books and practicing. So, I reasoned. I said, well, if Einstein could come up with this terrific theory simply by thinking from first principles, then I should be able to do something similar with spiritual knowledge by thinking from similar first principles, the knowledge given in the scriptures. And so that was always my policy. In other words, I never took anything on authority. I never accepted something just because it's tradition. Although these are good places to start, one should be able to think things through and verify them by one's own intelligence. This is the criterion of realization as opposed to simply knowledge. Anybody can read a book and just repeat what is said in the book like a parrot. Huh? Rock equals MC squared. Rock. Give me a cracker. <laughs> You know, but that doesn't mean they can use that theory. That doesn't mean they really understand that theory. Only if you think everything through from the beginning, yourself, using your own intelligence, then you can say you really understand something. And then, of course, the absolute acid test is if you can apply it if you can actually realize it for yourself. See? So if you just sit around watching YouTube videos about spiritual stuff, and you don't actually do the meditation and the work and the study huh, and the practices, then it's just entertainment. It's just useless. You know, like the people who read books about Einstein, but they never actually read Einstein's books, and they certainly never try to duplicate his thinking through the principles of physics until they come up with relativity. Huh? Similarly, people watch TV or you know, YouTube or read books on spiritual life, and they never actually do the, the work or follow the principles given in those materials. And so they can't say from their own experience that something is right or wrong. They don't know. All they know is what somebody else said. And then we see people have huge arguments about what so-and-so said versus what somebody else said. <laughs> and none of them know anything on their own. <laughs> oh, it's pretty sad. 
So this is what I'm encouraging you to do. And the reason I'm talking about all of this is because tomorrow's video is based on this. And we're going to discuss a very recent scientific theory that also is based on the principles of the Vedas and has the potential to revolutionize biology. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti Aum.